In this video, we're going to talk about full-time traveling versus overlanding. So in the traveling community, people tend to label themselves as one type of traveler versus another. Right. There are labels like overlanders, van lifers, full timers, uh, bike packers, world schoolers. world schoolers, right? So there's all these different labels. And ultimately, they, there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of things in common. Mm -hmm. We don't really self-identify with any of them, maybe besides full timer. But even as a full timer, that's kind of a, a difficult thing to explain. Like, what does that really mean? You know, so really, I, I think what we do is a combination of several of these. And I think for the most part, everyone is a combination of a, of a few different types of traveling. Mm -hmm. So I want to just kind of explain our rationale and our style of travel. Why we don't want to label ourselves or what why we, we do label. I want to give you guys just some ways that I define these different terms. It's fine to do anything. It's just us personally. Yeah. We don't like to label ourselves. Well, we don't. We have a hard time labeling ourselves one or the other because we don't totally identify with any of them completely. That's the gist of what we're going to talk about in this one, which is like what kind of traveling do we do? So we can go back to the very beginning. Like we sort of we started this lifestyle as just extended trips. Extended trips, right? Yeah. Like. You know, family vacation, sort of, but a little bit longer mm -hmm. with some pauses in between for the first couple of years when we were raising our first child and becoming pregnant with our second and third child. We paused between the first and the second trimester of each pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then we waited until the, the baby was born. And we left after like three to five months from each one after that. And then we were on the road all in between we kind of eased into it. We didn't go 100%. We didn't get rid of our house in the town that we used to live in. Yeah, it was a gradual. Everything was gradual. There was no like, this is our date and this is our anniversary date. Like, we right. don't really have that like that a lot of people have nowadays. Yeah, so the first couple of years, I even struggled with the term full-timer. Mm. You know, I didn't want to say I was a full-timer, even though we were spending more time on the road than we were back at the house where, you know, we would only stay there. Like if we were going to the hospital for doctor's visits. Mm -hmm. as, as the term full-timer, I think what it means, it's people that live in their RV. As, as their, a full-timer, you don't even have house. to travel. Yeah. Right? There are full-timers that live in their RV on their own land. There are full-timers that, that work seasonal jobs, that go to a place and stay for three, four months while they work a job. And then go somewhere else for three, four months while they work another job and on and on and on. And then there are full timers that um, their their goal is not to travel. Their goal is to save money, hmm. you know. Which is there's a new movie called Nomadland that's coming out, which has I think three real full time van dwellers in this movie. Some of them are really well known, like Cheap RV Living. Oh, I thought it was all made up. No, it has real people. Yeah, it has three real cool. people that that are that play themselves, their sort of role in the movie, they act as mentors to Frances McDormand's character. So yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's that. Those are kind of like your traditional van dwellers before before van lifing was, was a thing, before van lifing was cool. So, you know, these are, these are all, so you can see the, the term full-timer has a wide range. And then there's van life. And I think van life had just gotten really cool thanks to, uh, Thanks Foster. to Foster Huntington, who sort of coined this phrase back in the day. And speaking of which, I think we're in the second home is where you park version, it. or not yeah. the not the second edition, but the second the, book. The second home is where you park it book, the van life book. Even yeah. though we were in our four wheel camper, so van life started out as like young people seeing what these van dwellers were doing and say, "Yeah, that's that's great. I want to travel like that too." And buying vans, converting them, and then living in them. Going surfing, going climbing, going skiing, doing all these different things. And as you guys know, since then, van lifing has become this, you know, multi-billion dollar industry where Airstream is selling, I think, their 
most recent van that they're selling the Atlas is $260,000. And that is not what a, a van lifer at the beginning was doing. Right. Right. I mean, even our van, our van, we bought ours new and that's $60,000. But it makes sense for us because, you know, this is what we live in and $60,000 is a very cheap place to buy to live. You know, and, and we have compared to a house. Yeah, and in California, we have careers and we've had good jobs and we can afford this. But if you're just like a college grad in your early twenties and you just want to spend a couple years traveling, and that's sort of where this kind of van life thing. Yeah, it's like an alternative to, to backpacking to Europe. Like instead right. of like, okay, I just finished school, let's go backpack. It's like let's get a van converted and drive around. In the nineties and maybe even before that, in the eighties, seventies. Taking a year off after college and going backpacking across Europe and getting your Eurorail pass and like yeah. even hitchhiking was like the thing. A bunch of our friends did it, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that had van life had become that for this new generation. So we're not those people. Like we're not <laughs> like we don't identify with van life, van lifers. But of course, so much of what they do, we have in common too. And we, we come across them when we travel mm -hmm. and we stay at the same places. We hang out, you know, with the same people a lot of the times. And they're... We're a little like, older. We're, we're, we're older than your sort of uh, Instagram van life right. person. And, you know, and also a lot of these younger people don't have kids. It's interesting now because it's been around, been a thing for so long. Now, a lot of these van life couples have gotten married and a lot of them are having kids so i feel like there's like a oh you can do it with kids look at these people and some of them will right. point to us so that's how we sort of identify with van life and also not as well and then there's overlanding like we were never we never consider ourselves overlanders mm -hmm. we actually never even heard the term overlanding until years and years and years into our travels mm -hmm. So really the only time that we ever heard of it is when we decided to downsize our Airstream and then we decided to buy a four-wheel camper with our truck because we already had the truck mm -hmm. or, or we still need a truck to tow our Airstream because we didn't sell our Airstream and we wanted something small and then we bought this four-wheel camper after doing some research and it turns out it's a super popular camper and vehicle for overlanders and then, then we started to kind of be lumped into this overlanding category and because we're going to Baja because we're going to mainland Mexico mm -hmm. and we had met a bunch of people through that who had done the Pan American drive all the way down to you know Tierra del Fuego and mm -hmm. all the way up to Prudhoe Bay Alaska so you know that kind of became a thing and then when we decided that we we were going to ship our vehicle to Europe and I think it's also because that we had been so accustomed to having the ability to have four-wheel drive where we don't feel as concerned driving on dirt roads or soft sand and we felt like four-wheel drive was a worthwhile upgrade to pay for mm -hmm. and suddenly like a four-wheel drive sprinter continued to lump us into these overlander category even though we don't particularly feel like we're overlanders because all the overlanders and this is not obviously everybody but a lot, of, a lot of the overlanders that we've talked to and met, they're very sort of goal-oriented. Like, they, they, we want to drive around the world, or we want to drive the Pan American Highway, or we want to, you know, do the Silk Road. It's or, more of a trip than... Than a life. Yeah. Yeah. So for us, this is what we do. Like, we work on the road. We have a sustainable way of living on the road. That's how we identify as full-timers. Mm -hmm. We're in a van, that's how I identify as van lifers. Mm -hmm. And we go on these more off the grid adventure trips, mm -hmm. like when we went to North Cap Norway or we went to, you know, these remote places in Greece and Turkey. And Morocco. Morocco. Yeah. yeah. And Baja and Mexico. Mm -hmm. We go on all these different types of adventures in our full time living that overlanders would go on. So that's why I think for us it's been difficult to really identify. We've we've had a lot of trouble identifying who we are. And <laughs> in every part of this, not only do we feel like that it's hard time for us to identify, I also feel like that a true overlander will look at us and say, "Oh, you guys aren't overlanding." We don't have that shovel. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't even have our we don't even have our sand ladder anymore. <laughs> It's too much trouble. It's just too leave much it stuff at to my carry. parents' house. Right. We don't, you know, we're not, 
necessarily van life. We don't check all the boxes of everything. Right. So what do we say? What's our thing? We here? do our own thing. But we say we're just living on the road. Right. We're not living in a house. We're living on the road. So all the things we normally do, we just do it from yeah. this vehicle. Recently, we just talked to somebody on the phone who they're Austrians and they had shipped their big truck to Australia and then Thailand and then mm-hmm. to North America and they were doing this overlanding trip and then they were forced to come back to Europe to Austria because their six month visa had run run out in North America or in US and they had to come back they had nowhere to go they couldn't go into Canada mm-hmm. so they came back and said oh yeah how long how much longer when are you guys going back to the US and we're like oh we don't we we're thinking maybe two more years after having already been here two years. Yeah. And he's like, What? Why? <laughs> why are you That's here? what he said. He said, Why? And then a lot of people have told us, you know, there are so many other countries that are that are not as developed as Europe and North America. You should go see those first before they change. But for us, it's like we're not so goal oriented in a way that like we got to go see Cuba before it turns into something. We got to go see this before it turns into something. Mm-hmm. I will see the country or whatever place we're at mm-hmm. when we get there and see what it's like at that point. Because if you go see it now, well maybe you want to see it mm-hmm. again after or later. You know, a perfect example is the United States is super developed, Europe is super developed, but we're still finding very great remote places that you can go to. Yeah. You know, so I don't feel like there's a need to rush and go see these things, and especially if it means that you have to do it in the short period of time. And I think it's like we started this lifestyle gradually, like we didn't like sell all our crap and hit the road, you know? Right. And I think our travel has progressed to that same gradual feeling like we started in California, we did like a little loop to Florida and back. And then we went like north and back. And kind of mm-hmm. the Midwest. And then we we're considering Alaska, but oh, we didn't go to the Northeast yet. So let's do that. So we gradually accumulated 48 states. And then we're like, oh, well, we did this. So now let's go to Alaska. Yeah. Oh, we finished that. Okay, let's go to Mexico now. And then, you know, gradually we ended up in Europe. And even after Alaska, Canada, Mexico, Newfoundland, Labrador, mm-hmm. even after going to all these places in 2017, before the year before Europe, we're like, I just want to do the West. I just want to do the Western states of U.S. one more year. Yeah. You know, see how we feel. Because I really love this area. So I really just want to do this one more time. Even though we've been there for like nine years at this yeah. point. I just want to do it one more time. So we took our four-wheel camper. We drove around, you know, places. And then we went to even more places that we hadn't been to before mm-hmm. because our airstream was too big. You know, so I really do feel like our 10 years spent in North America exploring was was not too much time. In fact, I think we could... People do more, you know. Yeah, we didn't see. There's everything. so much more you can see. Yeah. So I don't feel like, you know, I, it 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 really like, um, it actually it doesn't make sense for me for people to say, oh, you know, why are you here for so long? Well, what did you do there for so long? If I my mentality was always, there's not enough time to see it all. I feel like after four years of Europe, we're not we're still not going to be comfortable with I, what we've seen we're still worried about how we're gonna get down to to italy and back well how, <laughs> how much italy we're gonna see we're gonna get to yeah. see so yeah i mean that's you know and, and, and i think part of that has to do with us having built a sustainable way to travel like we have diversify our income where we are able to make money we have people that we can rely on for mail like mail goes to your parents house now we have we've had used mail delivery services in the past mm-hmm. You know, so we have these these mechanisms and systems that we've put together that help, you know, with this lifestyle for it to be yeah. sustainable. So we don't have to save up, travel for a year, stop, save up again, travel for a year, stop, save up again. So not only are we able to travel full time, in fact, we're just living like this. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're just living in a house, nobody ever says, oh, you lived in L.A. for so long. Why? <laughs> you know, people live in one place. So many yeah. people live in one place for their whole lives and nobody asks them why. Mm-hmm. So for us, it's like, hey, we want to stay in Europe. Mm-hmm. In fact, for the last two years, you know, we've basically have always just thought, you know, what? we're not just on a trip here in Europe. Mm-hmm. We're living in Europe right now. Yeah, And we dialed you know? it in where we 
built our life on how to make ourselves happy and all the different puzzle pieces that allow us to stay on this road and it allows us to slow travel. Like we're not yeah. in a rush. We're not in a rush to get to some point because we have limited time or money. We can. That's probably why it takes us so long to get anywhere because we're yeah. just comfortable working, doing school, and all that stuff takes time. And you can't drive. You can't drive every day when you have to do those other things. But I really look forward, you know, because like in the like in the U.S. where we go back to California and Arizona area every winter, mm-hmm. not just for holidays but for the better um, better like warmer weather too. We kind of have that same routine now in Europe.、Mm-hmm. We come back to Croatia. The Croatia just happens to be a really good central central location. Like this year, we don't know if we're gonna, you know, our if if everything's more or less back to normal to a certain extent, we'll go back out to Spain and Portugal. But just the other day, we say, hey, maybe we'll go back to Greece again, because、mm-hmm. we spent two months in Greece last year. But I don't feel like we've seen enough. Yeah. So you know that's. Sort of how our mind works. We don't, we don't set a lot of goals. We don't have a huge amount of planning involved. We set a general direction,、mm-hmm. and we just kind of go with that when the time comes. But everything's subject to change, like up until the last minute. So. And that works for us. And、It、I doesn't know, work for everybody, but that's that's. Yeah. So the I guess the bottom line is fine. Don't let these labels define who you are and how you travel. Just find the way that works for you. Yeah. Even if it means a lot of people won't understand it, but、yeah. that's okay. Figure out how you can be happy for yourself. Yeah. So I hope that was helpful. And if you guys have any questions, ask them in the comments below. And、uh, you know, we'll、uh, try to answer them as as much as we can.、Mm-hmm. And we'll see you guys in the next one.